why Quebec? And I think that was tied to your school, right? Um, and just a little bit more on how the immigration part of it went for you, because you would have done your research by that point and know that Quebec is special, I'm assuming. <laughs> <laughs> what did you study? And mm-hmm. this is a private college. So mm-hmm. I know that initially everything was fine in terms of postgraduate mm-hmm. work permit. And then along the way, things changed. Something changed. Da-da-da. Something changed. And it was not a nice change. Yeah. Um, and I want you to talk about like, well, did you engage a consultant? Did you get help? Um, was it just the school that was advising you? Did you get an immigration consultant for any of your applications? Mm-hmm. And um, also like what you chose to study in the school in terms of the program and the, you spoke, said it was two years already, but how that would have helped you towards your overall immigration goal of permanent residency. That's a whole heap of questions, sorry. <laughs> but it combines my whole life. So I, I think I can put it together. <laughs> All right. The reason I came to Quebec, Montreal in particular, is because the scholarship, and if you heard about the scholarship and that story, I think you need to check out the video before. (laughs) So um, the scholarship they were offering was only for the Montreal campus. Ah. Oh, so So there's more than one campus. There's two campuses. There's one in Ontario and there's one in um one in Quebec. I was not trying to come to the to the Quebec um campus because I was fearful of the French. So for those who don't know, Quebec is predominantly French and now they have taken steps to make French the primary official language. Okay? So initially this wasn't a case when I was coming here. So when I did my research, one of the first questions I asked the recruitment advisor was, will I have to study in French? Mm -hmm. And she said, no, classes are offered in both French and English. Oh, interesting. Right. Come in here. I knew no one here had no family. That's what I was going to ask. Okay. No family. Mm -hmm. I come here by myself. Mm -hmm. My orphan self. (laughs) Joking. (laughs) (laughs) I had no family here, no friends. I knew absolutely nobody here. And um, so my in talking now to because initially I was trying to figure it out by myself. I ha- I was able to use savings and whatnot to pay for all of the, the the starter fees, right? Having done all that, and now telling my family now everybody's kind of trying to find out: Do you have family there? Let's see who we can call to find a connection. Probably a connection through a church because church for me is a is a is a is a family. So they were trying to find out, do we have anybody at all in Montreal? And a friend of a friend of a friend. And I found somebody to stay with here. So cool. that was okay. And they were okay. We're a little timid, but we're good. Now, in terms of my personal immigration story. So in the previous video that you're going to watch, because you're good people, uh, as I said in... May, I got my letter of acceptance, which is the LOA. So I got that from the school. And so what I had to do, I did not consult an immigration consultant. I didn't. Um, All my information that I received was either I was still back in immigrants or IRCC website (laughs) or other people who I knew made the transition here. And I was calling them to find out like what was their process like. Um, what did they have to do? What steps do I need to take? Also, I would search for like the Jamaica Canadian Association of Ontario. I started following them on Instagram. I followed the Montreal page. So I was just trying to get information from every source I possibly could to put yeah. all of it together and make sense of it. Um, while at the simultaneously looking on the Quebec government website because that had additional information that you would not find on IRCC. And as we all know, Quebec is completely different from every other province in Canada. It's nearly, it's so it's almost that, its own country. Almost. <laughs> I mean, they want it to be. <laughs> They've been wanting it to be for a long time. So yeah. yeah. So I got the LOA, the letter of acceptance. 
And then I had to apply for a CAQ. So no other province has this. The CAQ is a, I'm not going to try to speak French. I'm not about to, um, to embarrass myself on people on YouTube. Um, the CAQ in English is Certificate of Acceptance. Okay. The abbreviation is because of the French translation. Cer Certificat d'acceptance. Uh, this is why I'm not trying. Right. I'm... <laughs> I'll put it on Do screen. I'll put it on screen. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Let's just hide this video from my Francization teacher. <laughs> Please. <laughs> right. So you had to get a CAQ. The CAQ is basically saying that Quebec is accepting you to come and study here. Ah, so that's from the province. So on so a provincial you level, you have to get acceptance. And from the school, you yeah. have to get acceptance. Interesting. Yes. So it's three levels. You have to do the LOA from the school, the CAQ from the province, and then apply for the study permit from the federal level. And if you don't do it in that order you're going to have issues, right? So I had to do my research to find out those particular steps because anybody else in any other province wouldn't have known right. that you have to do a CAQ. And this is why I always say to people, if you want to come to Canada, you have, you have to, you have to, you have to. Do your research. It is okay to talk to an immigration consultant. It is okay to, to, to listen to other people's story, but do your own research because you, you know your situation particularly, you know where you're trying to go and it is better you have information and then ask questions to confirm what you know or be in a position to ask them. But I saw this on the IRCC website. So what does this mean? Because sometimes people are giving you advice and they probably legitimately forget to give you a piece of it that might be vital to your particular situation. So research, 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 research is important. Important. <laughs> so those are the three levels. Um, and then, I don't, do you guys have to do ARIMA? No, not ARIMA. Um, there was a next arrive can during the COVID yes. period. You had to do arrive can yeah. as well. I think they yes. take that out, but so, yeah, that was very that was very COVID mm -hmm. specific across Canada. Right, because when I came, it was kind of still in the middle of COVID. Places hadn't opened back up and everything, and I had to get my um, COVID booster, upload the COVID information. Really? Yes. The booster yes, shot. Yes. Really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that was essentially my journey. Um, and that, that's kind of the, the idea of how Quebec immigration works. You get the LOA. I think there, oh, there's a part I didn't say. So you get the LOA. Um, you apply for your CAQ using your LOA. But also, um, it would be advisable to pay the first semester's tuition. Before. So that, I yeah. Visa. Mm hmm because even before you get the um the CAQ. Oh, I see. When you get the LOA. Mm hmm Because a part of it is that so for my school they said, well, if you don't get through, we'll reimburse you that tuition. And that is an important question to ask. Of course, at that time, a lot of it was tied into COVID and not sure if the, the rules were gonna change based on the situation. Right. But I think that question might be still relevant now. So for us, if we didn't get our study permit, um, our school at the time had said we'd reimburse you that first um, first semester's tuition if you do not get through. Yeah. So I was confident to pay it. I think that's a good question to ask no matter what, mm -hmm. because like right now, I just heard of a situation where somebody's on their third rejection money is paid to the school and they're concerned that they're going to lose the, the, the six thousand dollars of the tuition which i don't think is fair yeah that's not fair i don't think it's fair so hopefully that's not true but it's just it's a good question to ask when you're when you get accepted and you're paying your fees and all that qualify all these things because mm -hmm. um 
nothing is guaranteed in immigration, even if you yeah. a consultant, right? Nothing is guaranteed because at the end of the day, it's up to the Canadian government to say yes or no, and it's going to be circumstance based, right? Exactly. So always ask that question, right? Yeah. So you said that you, you you qualified that and you paid once you were accepted knowing that you felt safe doing that. Right. So, and I think that was a good idea that I did to pay that tuition and ask, and also ask that question. This is why I have to love my parents. I'm not going to, I don't know about anybody else. I have a good relationship with my parents and it kind of molded me into who I am today. And when we had that conversation, I said, well, dad, I want to do this. And, and mom was there too. And they didn't hesitate to say, if you're going to go higher in your education, we will support you comes on me. And I'm grateful for that. Um, even though I didn't want to put them through it again, because, you know, we're trying to adult in and whatnot. But yeah. they, all <laughs> they also asked questions that you didn't think of. I probably didn't think of right. And so it was okay. And even if I had thought about them, them asking me and me being able to answer them confidently kind of confirmed for me that I was making the right decision. So um, if you have a level-headed friend or a family member or your parents, I would suggest talking to them because there are probably certain things you're not thinking of because you're probably blinded by excitement or, you know, the whole process or stressed by the process. And it's always good to check in with somebody to keep you on, on, on that level. So um, there was that. Also, I had to get insurance before I came. Right. The school required that I have travel insurance before I came here. Um, so I had to get that as well. The funny thing about it was that, and to show you how special Quebec is, my advisor, which initially I thought was in Quebec, but was based in Toronto, did not know much about the immigration process overall. So it wasn't so, necessarily as international student advisor, but just a student advisor, probably. Right. So she did not know about, but she did an awesome job and we had awesome conversations. And I think she learned from my experience because I would, if I got my LO, if I got my CAQ, I would say, hey, I got my CAQ. I'm here in the process. This is my next step. Um, do you think there's anything you need to give me to provide for this step? And she was always willing to ask questions, always willing to um, to find out information I wasn't sure about. Um, so I'm grateful for her for that. Yes. But, but again, it shows how important it is for you to do your own personal research because she did not know about the international process at all, at all. And so she learned from my situation. So... Um, LOA, CAQ, then you had to do the um, biometrics. I think that was the only time that I had an issue with the biometrics. Um, I think my appointments had to get shifted because of work and stuff. And there was a time when the office was closed. Um, so there, that was probably the only place I had a little bit of challenge. But everything else was, was smooth. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, so then you found somebody who was you were able to live with in Quebec or in Montreal. Mm -hmm. So then, of course, you book your ticket, you go, they probably picked you up and all of that stuff. So that was helpful. And that was through networking. I know she said mm -hmm. church, but it's church, the church network, really. Mm -hmm. right. right. Which is super, super big. Um, If anybody has like a family <laughs> of churches, like global family of churches, it's likely that there's somebody there that can either point you in the right direction or help you. So that's a good networking tip. All right, cool. So then what did you study? And mm -hmm. this is a private college. So mm -hmm. I know that initially everything was fine in terms of postgraduate work. Mm -hmm. And then along the way, things changed. So tell me what you studied and then what happened while you were studying to kind of change um, the overall, well, plan. Of <laughs> <laughs> Something changed. Da, da, da. Something changed and it was not a nice change, yes. but I'm grateful still. Okay, um, cool. So, so what did you study and then the change, yeah. All right. So I studied audio and video post-production at Trebas Institute, Quebec, Inc. So it was a two-year program. I was supposed to start in January 2022 and end in January 2024. Okay. Okay. Initially, I'd applied for a film film program, which was one year. 
and be done with it. But as I said, my advisor said, do the two year more guaranteed for your PGWP. I said, well, that makes sense. We'll do the two year. Plus the scholarship was more. So <laughs> um, I arrived, I left Jamaica November 2021. Went to the U.S. to spend some time with family and acclimatize myself to the weather. Ah. I would. Yes. And I would recommend that for, if you can, try it. Because I was always the girl in the office with 100 sweaters and afraid of the AC, always cold. So I was like, I'm not trying to go into Canada and shock my system. So I came, I went to the U.S., spent some time with family worked through the Christmas, kind of acclimatized myself, learned how to dress for winter. Mm -hmm. That was important, not to overdress or underdress. Um, and then January, I landed in Quebec in the snow. So I got picked up and um, we're not going to talk about how I wore too much clothes in the um in the in the airport because i was overdressing for the winter and forgot that the airport was hot but something <laughs> something happened to me in the airport so i had my documents all printed out everything was put together because i'm an organized person and i had it in my carry-on luggage right so i had my check luggage my carry-on suitcase and a backpack with my laptop however I put my documents in my carry-on suitcase because it was, well, the rest that I thought I may not need, but just there in case. Um, so I had that in my carry-on suitcase. However, when I got to the airport, they were like, do you want to check this luggage? Well, check it for free. And I was like, yes, if you're going to check it for free, take it. And they took it. And Rochelle did not take out the rest of her documents, which was a big mistake because, you know, when you come to the port of entry, there's a particular document that you have to show before you even get to baggage claim. And I did not have that with me in my backpack. That was already on the plane. I landed in Toronto. Um, I did you remember? To baggage did you claim. remember like when you were on the plane? When did you, at what point did you remember? No, miss. No, <laughs> Is when, <laughs> when the officer was like, um, you need to have this document. In my mind, I thought I had it, yeah. truth be told. In my mind, I thought I had all the information that I needed. But what I had was my letter stating to pick up the visa. That wasn't enough. So I had the wrong document. Um, and so I didn't have the one that said, show this at the port of entry. But... Thank God, because I was stressed out. I was on the floor. The place was full. It was a whole bag of people coming from, from Atlanta. I had traveled from Atlanta to come over. And we were like all stuck in one place trying to provide this information. And the good thing about me is that I'm resourceful and I keep a copy of every single document on my computer. So I quickly pull up my computer. I said, listen, if I have it on my computer, will you let me through? And they said, fine. So on the ground, on the floor, in that airport at, um, what an airport name I turned? I don't remember. Pearson. Yes. So um, I was on the floor searching for that document. Found it on my laptop because I scanned every single thing. And I showed it to him. And that's how I got my study permit. Cool. Okay. So make sure y'all have your documents together. And keep a soft copy because that's important. That's important. Mm -hmm. And if they offer to check your luggage, remember that. But also, like I don't generally, I don't like when they they offer that. I'm like, no, <laughs> unless like I'm really trying to get rid of the, suit the suitcase. But if you if you if you want to get rid of the suitcase, let them offer to check it when you're at the gate, because that way you get it when you come out of the gate you're supposed to anyway right. and that was my mistake screen. because they offered to do it at the um Check the counter, counter. Mm -hmm. but yeah mm -hmm. and that, that was gonna go into the belly of the plane because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. when i went to the, the the port of entry section excuse me i said to him well my bags are gone to my connecting flight to montreal so i couldn't even get access to it right oh, yeah so yeah yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't good. even on the belt outside i thought this was when you were in no this is when you're in yeah. toronto 
So this yes. is a port of entry. So your four first port of entry, even if you're connecting, entry. the first port in Canada is where you do the immigration stuff. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Everything was good. Got through. Called a friend. She came. She picked me up. Carried home. Um, had my little excitement. Take my picture. Sent to my parents. Told them that I'm alive. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, okay, it was time to get settled. So, again, research, research, research. Before I came to Canada, I did two things. And this is a part of how your channel, as though by Canadian, Canadian immigrants, helped me. You did a, a video about breaking down the budget items, the line items of what you need to immigrate to Canada. Mm. And you, 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 you literally did a budget on the video. I can still see the um the words along the screen in my mind right now. Yeah. <laughs> and so I took what you had, mm -hmm. plus the research I had done on what additional stuff Quebec needed, and that is how I I budgeted my money to for what I needed to come to Canada. Right. When I told you, Cha, you helped me in my immigration journey. It's so funny because I don't even remember that video. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say how to prepare for winter on a budget. Nope. I remember nope. that one. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one too. But that I remember there was that one that you did budget wise, and then there was another one. Um, I think it was about when you landed in Canada, what to do. Okay. Um, and there was also the other oh backtrack. In the seven years I was um researching, I also looked at your other videos about the various streams yes and so as you were talking about the various streams i would go on ircc and look and say okay is this one possible for me i even downloaded forms to start the paper process and all this good stuff um do you remember the job bank you did with the atlantic immigration program yes i downloaded that too and i was like okay i applied to like two or three jobs never got through and then i was like i'm fed up with this mm -hmm. um so yeah <laughs> it's been me and you virtually yeah. for the past <laughs> for the past 10 years <laughs> having done that so now we're in quebec um i had researched add to my my repertoire the information about bus pass and getting around um montreal the school did a good job, and I have to give them their props. The school did a good job of providing us with um, partners. They had partnership with housing. They had partnership okay. with um, school equipment like laptops. They had partnership with insurance. So they had a couple of partnerships that we could take advantage of, which was good for me. Some I used, some I didn't use, but at least it was available. Right. Um, so I was able to know that, okay, I need an Opus card, how much the Opus card is going to cost. Because we use STM here in Montreal area. So did that. My friend followed me the first day to school, found the school, found out it was still legitimate, yeah. confirmed all of that. Mm -hmm. Had to get my SIN. I don't like calling it, but I don't like to have a SIN. But... <laughs> Got my social insurance, <laughs> insurance number. That was a laughing joke to this day. Um, as a Christian, you can imagine why. <laughs> um, got my SIN. I had to get a permanent code from my school in order to get my bus pass as a student. A lot of people didn't know that. I didn't know that. So I went to the, 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 the place and ask them for a card, but they said, no, you have to get a code from a school. So in essence, they give you a letter, so this is your permanent code. When you go to the the the, the bus office, the transportation office, um, they take that letter and then issue you your card. And um, I don't know when this episode is gonna air, but my Opus card is gonna be open like a month and I'm not looking forward to it because mm -hmm. I like the discount. Because you lose the perks <laughs> because basically like student stuff are discounted, right? Exactly. And they are very smart with it because every every year you have to renew. Ah. And you have to get a new letter from your school with a permanent code to renew it. Yeah. So I can't get, I'm no longer a student. I'm really doing adult stuff. Yep, adults in one not one. really okay. But the bank, okay. everybody, everybody going to switch on everybody. Your, everything and everybody. Yeah. Bank, student, <laughs> student bank accounts, there's no fees. Adult bank exactly. accounts, you have to pay monthly for them. Mm -hmm. the money for you. And I'm not looking forward to it, but it's life. Yeah. So, okay. So we're going through school. 
Um, I applied for jobs that was a bit hard to get. Plus, it was in the middle of winter. I wasn't really trying to get out of the house. But I needed to do what I needed to do. And where I start, where I stayed when I came to Canada was two hours from a two-hour commute to school. Wait, sounds like we're twinning. <laughs> Only for six months. You followed, you followed me. <laughs> you followed me, didn't you? <laughs> Don't follow me. Okay. Right, I so promise I had no intention. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a two hour commute. I had to do one bus, then another bus, then one train, then yeah. convert to another color line and then walk like two minutes. Right. Yes. So child. <laughs> um so good thing for the like the first three weeks it was still COVID, classes were online. Um, however, when I had to go to school, that was rough. Um, and then, so I got a job, two jobs. One was in vigilation. The other one was working in a freezer at night. And you'll see how this plays into everything. So I work in, in the freezer twice per week, doing school. Um, I'd have to call my aunt and say, hey, I need to stay awake. I'm coming from school, 7 o'clock in the, from work, 7 o'clock in the morning. Class is 10 o'clock. And you know you're up since 11 o'clock the night before. I said something has to give. So I searched for places and I moved closer to school. Now my commute was like 30 minutes to school and about 45 minutes to work instead of two hours for both. Oh, it was two hours for both? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the time of night and the place where you were going. Right. So that was hard. And then in August, June, June 2022, and I'm, I don't want to make any mistakes, so I'm going to read this. In June 2022, um, I, we received information over the radio that there will be a change to privatized education. What was the change? So essentially, and I'm just going to read this. This was what um, our school had sent, to, had sent us in response to the news that came out, mm -hmm. the announcement. Thanks. So on June 7, 2022, the Ministry of Education and Higher Education of Quebec announced changes the criteria related to the eligibility of the postgraduate work permit to international students at non-subsidized colleges in Quebec. The new policy related to the PGWP postgraduate work permit will be in effect as of September 1, 2023. According to this announcement, students who complete their program of studies before this date, August 31, 2023, will have access to the PGWP in full. So let me break this down. Mm -hmm. My program was supposed to finish January 2024, right? Because it was supposed to be a two-year program. Right. And that, so, that would include summers. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Summer break. Mm -hmm. We would get, so the usual schedule was like um, the first six weeks and then midterm you get one week break, right? Then you have an next six weeks because it was 15 week semesters. And then you get a break and then finals, a one week break and then finals. Okay. Then in the summer, you get like a three week break. Oh, three weeks. Right. That's three not a real weeks. summer. That's a joke. <laughs> if you thought that was not a real summer, think about how I did not have one this semester. Um, this year, actually. <laughs> so we went from having four, four, well, we, one week breaks, two week breaks within a semester to absolutely no breaks. Mm. To accelerate because the program. Yes. So with my school was a private institution and it was not subsidized by the government. Right. And, and so because of these two factors, um, they said, if you don't finish by August 31, 2023, you will not have access to the full amount of PGWP time that you would have originally gotten. Right. And this, of course, was only for Quebec. Oh, so weird. So, well, this was happening. 
um, or holiday was cut from four weeks to three. We were already on the holiday. Um, classes were supposed to begin the last week of August. They said, okay, the school was pretty cool in... Originally, I was mad at them because they didn't give us much information at the start. Everybody was frantic. And um, fortunately and unfortunately, I was a go-to person within my group to find out all the information, talk to school, stuff like that. You still had other people who were doing it, but a lot of people looked to me for the information. Um, so I was that point person in my class. So it was stress. It was a really stressful time because you're unsure. Some people are saying, what if we move to another province? It was super, super stressful. Um, and we were on a break. So it's not like you could go to class and see your friends talk about it and, and work through it. No, we're on a break. Having seen that, I left my night job because that was stressing me out. And thinking about getting the information from the school that we're going to accelerate the program, getting a new schedule that will have no breaks. I'm like, if I had a break before and I was and I couldn't, I was struggling, then listen, school come first. I came here to go to school. I did not come here to work and God will have to work it out. I'm grateful I have a good support system that said, OK. That was supporting, and I, and I moved closer to school. Yeah. So in my mind, I'm covering my rent, I'm covering my food. If I don't work, I can't pay my rent. Yeah. Um, I'm grateful for the support system I had, who said, okay, we'll help you with the rent. You just focus on school. And that, for me, took a huge Gosh. chunk of the burden off me because... I legit went down into depression and all of this, trying to figure this out. And then on top of that, I was trying to find a way to go to Jamaica to see my parents because I hadn't seen them since I left. And you know, you don't have anybody here. And then you moved away from the only support system you had. And so it was really, it was really a stressful time. Um, so having done that, they accelerated the program. Now would only get like two weeks break during the Christmas and for the year after that, this year, so last Christmas, we got two weeks break. Then since that, we've never had a break in order for them to finish dead on August 31. 31st. Mm -hmm. That's good on them, though, that they mm -hmm. were able to do something. I mean, I don't know that they didn't know about this change before. <laughs> That's what's coming to my mind, <laughs> but it was good on them to um kind of, you know, say okay, this is this you guys came for this for this reason. They encourage you to do exactly. a two-year program, so they really put things into place so that you exactly. don't get um the short end of the stick with this change in immigration. So they made yeah. it accelerated the program so that you would finish before the deadline or cut off, and then now you'd be eligible for a two-year, three-year work permit. Three years, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool. Well, that's good on the school. But mm -hmm. it, well, of course, it's stressful. And I'm, I'm glad you're at the end of it. It's September. Now, so you're <laughs> at the end of it. It's done. It's done. It's done. <laughs> I'm trying to remember because our program was consecutive semesters as well. But we knew that mm -hmm. from the very get-go. So it was like mm -hmm. January to August. And I think we got one break in like May. Like yeah. reading week or something. Mm. And we got, And that was it. Straight. I wasn't trying to do any job. My aunt tried to, <laughs> tried to encourage me and I tried to follow suit, but it was it was tough. It was tough. So good on you. Good on we you. We lost like about seven people from our group. Ah. People who went to other provinces just right. gave up. Some there was I think two students who just gave up. I reached out to them and I was like, Hey, I haven't seen you in a minute. They're like, Yeah, I'm working. I was like Wait, what happened to school? I was like, well, I can't do that and work, and the work that I'm doing would pay for school. I was like, uh, yeah. So we lost, we lost some people. But they weren't five or six people. I don't know their particular situation. Originally, I thought they were, but then I came to find out they had family. So I was like, okay, you have family, you're okay. I'm, I'm not trying to worry about you. Um, but there are others who moved to other schools. Um, which is something that people should keep in that, mind but... yeah. yeah that is something like, to keep in mind it is 
And I thought about it, but here was my reservation at the time. If I moved to another, I even wondered if I could go to like the Toronto uh, campus to, to finish it, you know. But my fear, and I guess I hadn't researched much at the time or enough because I was so stressed out. Um, in my mind, I was like, if I move to another school, I'm going to have to start over. Um, I would probably lose the, the support that I have here, which is almost MAGA. Um, and I didn't want to try to start over. You understand? So I was like, you know what? Let me just stay, stay it stick it out. Yeah. And see. And and afterwards, I can move to another province or something. That yeah. was my thought process. Yeah. And it worked out. C'est la vie. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to shift into talking about now that this is done, postgraduate work permit application and all of that stuff so we are going to continue this episode in the next episode so hit like if anything in this video struck home for you or was helpful to you hit the subscribe button if you are not a subscriber stick around hit the notification bell for new videos and we will see you in the next episode